But it's good to have you here. I want to I just let a few people that are going to be joining us know before we jump in and have some fun. And I want to tell you, friends, if you're up here tonight with us live, you're in for a treat. Because Pastor Ray Bevan is many things. He is a rock star. He is a evangelist. That's right. He yeah. is a father. He is a golfer. A scratch golfer, pretty much. Well, somewhere around there. I don't know. I'm 13, but I mean, yeah, I, I enjoy the game. Scratch I love is it. close. He is yeah, yeah. also an author and he is a comedian. And so he has many things, but also to us, he's a friend and he's an amazing gift to our church. He's been a few times and now to everyone that's joining us online. So uh, Pastor Ray Bevan, really good to have you with us at Link Church tonight. Thanks for being here, bud. Oh, it's, it's fantastic. And it's great to represent Welshmen here in South Africa. You know what, Dylan, you may not know this, right? But they did a survey, just a bit of a, a bit of trivia. They did a survey in Wales, right, on, on marriages, and they they did a survey, and they wanted to find out um, when when Christian couples made love, right? And they disca- they discovered that Welsh men like to make love to their wives on days beginning with T. That's interesting, isn't it? Amazing survey. So that's Tuesday and Thursday, today and tomorrow. Saturday and Sunday. <laughs> I don't know whether that's true, Dylan. I don't know. I just thought I'd put that out there coming from Wales. Look, friends, all I want to know, all I want you to know is that this could go anywhere tonight. There is going to be gold, but you may have to dig for it because, you know, Ray Bevan, he's just an unplayable human being. But this is what it's all about. I have some favorite preachers of you, Ray Bevan, just before we talk a little bit more. My favorite preachers are some of the ones that you've preached at Link actually are incredible. Flood the Runway on Gratitude. I loved it. Uh, Remember the Duck. That was a great title. Loved that. Uh, Grace has a dance. Uh, If you guys haven't watched these, go and YouTube them. They're all over. You'll you'll, you'll pick up on these messages. They're amazing. But there was one you preached in Norway. And I I know we're going to take a chance on this tonight. There'll be people listening. And if you you check out too soon, you'll miss the goal. But tell us about what went down in Norway, because it was the most unlikely story that ended up in a great kind of God story, right? So it was, it was, it was amazing. There was, there was. Uh, are you sure you want me to say this? Well, I'm going to say it anyway, because I mean, it actually happened, right? So there was me, Brian Houston, and Casey Treat, and we were preaching in Norway. Now, um, you know, swear words are cultural, okay? So like. Um, some words you can say in Norway, you can't say here. Well, I didn't know this. So I'm preaching to leaders about, you know, how to prepare when you're preaching. So, and, and, and uh, Augie, the pastor, is interpreting for me. So I'm, I'm saying right now, you know, before you, uh, you when you're preparing, you've got to get focused and Schlöger Mögen, Schlöger Mögen. And then, uh, it, then you've got to channel your and Schlöger Mögen. Uh, and I said, you've got to guard your mind because little things can upset you before you preach. Mergen, slurgen, mergen, slurgen. I said, the dog could actually do it on the carpet in your house before you left. And, and he goes, Lurgen, smurgen, slurgen, shitting, slurgen, mergen. I said, what? what did you just say? You just swore. He said, no, you said the dog shit on the carpet, right? I said, you can't say that. He said, sure. He said, you're in Norway. We, I dropped my Bible. I say, oh shit, look, I dropped my Bible. So I said, what? So right on the spot, Dylan, I preached a message called, oh shit. And I started, I went through every, and Brian Ustam is in the front going like this, right? I said, no, you, you, gotta, you can't let an opportunity like this pass. So I started with uh, Moses with the Red Sea, uh, the Egyptians breathing down their neck. I mean, I painted the picture and then when Moses went through and the Egyptian army followed them and when the Egyptian army was in the middle of the Red Sea and they saw the waters coming back in, the last words of Pharaoh was, oh shit. And I I went through the whole thing. I did David and Goliath and then I finished up with the devil at the resurrection. And I went, did the whole thing. And now the whole audience were really up for this, right? And, uh, and Jesus went down into death and the devil shouted to death, you've got to hold him. 
If you don't hold him, we will lose our hold on humanity. But the Bible says death could not hold him. And he rose from the dead. And the last words of the devil was, and they all shouted, oh, shit. <laughs> that message went everywhere. I, I, look, if I've offended anybody, I'm sorry. But that, in Norway, you can say that word. And, and that's a true story. And I love that because... <laughs> One of the one of the biggest gifts about your life, and I mean that story is hilarious. The first time you told it to me, I, I couldn't believe I was hearing it. But I, I love the fact that it, it it went down and people chose to trust Jesus because you leveraged a moment that was contextual. And sure. uh, I just love that. And I, and I I've loved the way that you will use anything to reach people with the story of Jesus. Anything that's in between, like the barriers, you just get those right out the way. I remember being at the Zambiti Golf Club. And we had finished our round and we we're gonna have a drink off the golf club, off the golf round. And I remember you looking at the barman and starting to chat to them, chat to them. You had these guys in stitches to the point where four of them, you said, come on, let me pray and let me minister to you and let's trust Jesus to speak to your life. And right there at Zambidi Golf Course, yeah, you ministered to four barmen that have never been thanked in their lives like they were that day. And Jesus got a hold of their hearts. So I just wanna honor you, uh, Ray Bevan. These stories are funny but it goes way beyond the laughter that we experience. It's all about your heart for people. And and really, that's why we wanted to talk tonight, because uh, I know your stories will keep us in stitches for days. There are more to come tonight, but yeah. Now, humor is like, you know, Paul said to Timothy, he said, make full proof of your ministry. And that's a nautical term. It means hoist every sail so that the wind can catch the sail. And one of those sales for me is humor. And yeah. uh, you know, for me, I use humor uh, uh, so that people can open up. Very often when preachers uh, preach, they, they presume that people are listening to them. Now they're hearing them, many of them, but sometimes their minds are on their problem at home. They can be sitting in church listening to a preacher and their minds could be filled with stress and worry. When you're laughing, you can't laugh and worry at the same time. Okay? That's good. So, so it's a humor for me. It's like the sun coming out. Flowers don't open up till the sun comes out. And, and preachers got to understand if the seed is going to go into good soil, then people's hearts have to open up to receive it. And I use humor and music to do that. And it seems to it work pretty well. It does. And in fact, uh, we call you the golden tonsils at Link Church because you have a <laughs> voice. And in fact, many people, <laughs> many people off the Instagram live feed, when we sang uh, Right, Sally, Right, they said, we want that to come yeah. again. Son and I said, I'm not sure we do it again. It really wasn't my thing. But, you know, they, they, they're screaming for it, Ray. So we're going to have to see what happens at the end of tonight. Um, yeah, okay. But uh, Laughter is a big deal. I mean, you speak about that. And I think in this season, laughter is like medicine for the soul because yeah. there is a lot of stress and a lot of worry. And I love how you say you yeah. can't worry and laugh at the same time. And so, yeah. uh, you know, that's just such a great gift for us. Um, I'm interested to know how you're living it up in lockdown. What has it felt like for you? I mean, I know you, you're far away from home, although we would yeah. call Belito your second home. But uh, what's it been like for you? Well, you know, without something to like, super spiritual home is you know for me like because i'm traveling a lot you know um because I, I i said i said to the lord once lord i nowhere feels like home these days because i'm traveling and i'm on a plane or whatever now here i am in south africa away from wales and do you know what he said to me he said he said i'm your home yeah. uh, he said wherever you go i'm there and I've really enjoyed my time here in Belito. Um, um, you know, I, I've been here now, I think, for nearly two months. And I, I've really got to develop um, a deeper relationship with the Holy Spirit. He's my best friend. Wow. And I, think, I think ministry can clutter us up. And I think sometimes we, we can be so ministry related that we forget who we really are related to. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and, and, you know, instead of working for him, you actually get to know the one you work who works with you. So that's what it's been like for me here in this lockdown. Yeah. I've been loving it, I, loving it. I think that that's so good. And I think when people hear that, they can assume right up front that it's like, oh, but that's easier for you. 
Uh, but that's not true. All of us have something that we'd rather be doing, but God has called us to this time, or He's allowed for this time on us. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm interested. What books are you reading? Uh, I know you're writing a book. Is it by Grace alone that you're writing at the moment? Yeah, um, I've been working on this for about uh, three years. And um, while, while I've been here, I've written the last six chapters. So um, I'm in the process. Uh, the next stage is to edit that. But what I've been doing is uh, a lot of the messages that I've been uh, that I preached over 25 years in my in in the church I pastored for 25 years. Some of those messages I've only preached once, or some of them not even preached at all. Just prepared them. So I've been going through those messages, rewriting them, getting fresh revelation from them, and I I just been just loving it, just loving it. I'm excited to read the book, and uh, obviously we've heard a whole lot of those messages, but uh, yeah. I think there's more coming, so I'm excited for that. Um, yeah. I'm interested to talk just a little bit, just shout out to everyone that's joining us online. I'm looking across my phone here, seeing people jumping on. Great to have you. They're enjoying the story, by the way. Some aren't commenting, but that's because they're still <laughs> figuring it out. They're South African. Um, Are you, but, uh, <laughs> no, they, they love you, Ray. So yeah. um, it's good to have you guys all with us. And uh, we're going to be talking transitions tonight. So we're going to be talking about negotiating transitions, which is an apt conversation to be having right now. Uh, but yeah. before we get there, I want to talk a little bit about this morning. You spoke about revitalizing your faith. And you, you kind of made this statement that faith is like a servant. David's a picture of service. Yeah. And faith is a servant that goes out to fight our Goliaths for us. Yeah. And um, you spoke about how sometimes we we too weary in our physical strength to send faith to do the work, you know, and you, you broke that down. But I got a question for you. One or two people asked me afterwards. They said, what if you wake up and you just don't have faith? You just... You just got nothing left. You, you're wanting it to work, but you got nothing left. And obviously, there's you know context for what they're trying to say. But I'd love you to break that down a little bit for us. What, how do I send faith to work when I don't feel like I've got any? Well, it's like look, faith. First of all, faith um, is not emotional. You got to you, you you if if you get that, faith has got nothing to do with the way you feel. It's got nothing to do with the way you think but it's got everything to do with who you believe. And I think when you've come to the end of yourself, emotionally, mentally, then you, you've got to remind yourself of some absolutes. Like, Jesus still loves me. Amen. Like, Jesus is still working on my behalf. Um, those foundations should be already established in your heart. So, um, that that those and those are not emotions; those are absolute facts. And um, and my faith is uh, actually founded on those absolute facts. I'm always That's loved; great. never leaves me. Um, he's always working for my good. Um, there are times when I get rushes; I call them rushes. Uh, so if I can describe it, where you suddenly feel, "Woof! I can really believe for this." But generally, um, um, the just shall live by faith and not emotion. And yeah. uh, like I said, uh, you know, this morning, faith in the grace of God and the word of God, they are unchangeable and movable. Uh, so you can always rely on those absolutes. Yeah, I love that because, I mean, I suppose for anyone, they start to feel like, especially in times like this, where the reality is businesses are closing, uh, people's lives have shut down, things are having to be recalibrated. And so there's yeah. a lot of uh, panic setting in and people go, I need faith to get through this. And they start getting that kind of like, I don't have enough, I don't have enough, I don't have enough. But I love what you're saying. It's not whether you have enough or not. It's that you have everything, but do you trust him in it? And uh, I, I just I just love that thought that Jesus is for you is an absolute. That's where your faith begins. It's not it's not that you need to question whether He's there. He is, and um, yeah. and so that that's really powerful. I want to say anyone who didn't get the message this morning, go and listen to it. it's up on YouTube. Link Church, it's awesome. Uh, you'll really be encouraged with it. Another thing that really helped me, um, especially um, you know when you're in the ministry or when you when you're serving or. Um, I talk about the fire that needs no fuel. Whenever you, whenever you uh, talk, uh, read about the fire in Scripture, it's normally connected to uh, calling or purpose. So here's Moses, a 40-year-old failure, 
right? The last thing that was on his mind was the call of God or doing the will of God. He tried it. It didn't work. I'm out of here. So he's standing before a bush and the fire is in the bush. The fire is the presence of God, okay? So the fire is in the bush, but the fire doesn't need the branches of the bush to perpetuate the flame. It just so And so the Lord said to me, you know, when I feel, you know, I, I'm not emotionally up to it or not mentally up to it. I remember the Lord saying to me once, Ray, I don't need anything that you have to burn. I just burn. That's he awesome. said, said there's a uh, well, he said there's a there's an anointing in you that just burns there's a fire in you i am in you like a fire i just burn and whether you're up or down it makes no difference um and and that really has helped me especially as a minister you know when i'm going through a difficult time and i'm not emotionally up that's my confidence I love that. I love it. And I know one of your heroes and friends was Reinhard Bonnke, who went to be with Jesus. Yes. But um, yeah, he, he was a good... I want to I know, what was it about him? I mean, obviously, everyone knows the name, but what, what was it about this man, right? Because there was something significant about him. He was pure. Reinhard sure. was pure. And uh, I, I, I remember I was on a board, like he was doing a, a big um, outreach in the UK, and I was on his board. And the only reason I agreed to go on his board is because I knew that three times a year he would come and minister to the board. Right? That, I was a bit selfish. So I remember we had a board meeting. I never forget it. And I, I was so excited that he was coming to speak to us. So I thought I'll make him a nice cup of tea now and I'll, I'll give him a cup of tea when he comes into the room. So he comes into the room at nine o'clock. Like, like, you know, like, Anyway, he comes into the room and he, I can see he's on, he's just burning to share, right? So I said, hello, Reinhardt, I said, would you like a cup of tea? He says, cup of tea? Ray, I tell you now. And, I, and I'm thinking, I only asked him for a cup of tea. I tell you now, when you come to a wall, and I'm standing there with the teacup. When you come to a wall, do not look at the wall. Look for the pole to pole vault over the wall. And I, and I said, you want sugar? You want sugar? And you Listen, he says, and before you pole vault over the wall, you pick up the pole and you hit the devil on the head with the pole. And I only asked him, does he want a cup of tea? You know what I mean? He's like, he was, he's like that nine in the morning, three in the morning. But an absolute passion to win souls, to tell people about Jesus. It's amazing. I love, I love that. Right well, now. it's definitely got off on you. I mean, that's for sure. Every time you go anywhere, there's just this, uh, you're in the moment, but there's always a chance somebody is going to encounter Jesus. And wow. that could come through a golf game, that could come through a joke, that could come through a scripture, that could, and so I just I just love that. So you've, wow. you've been a few different versions of Ray Bevan in life, if you like. You have been <laughs> a pastor, well, you were a rock star. Then you were a traveling kind of evangelist, then you passed to a local church. They told me I was a sex symbol in the 60s. I don't know what happened there. You know what I mean? But there you go. Women used to, <laughs> scream. Women used to scream my name in the 60s. They still scream my name, but for the wrong reasons now. But anyway, that's <laughs> So you've been many things. That's the point. And, okay. um, and so anyway... But one of the things uh, you've probably felt in all that is transition, right? So you've changed, seasons have changed. And sometimes it's been, uh, like, I don't know what you call it earlier on. You call it like a, some, there's a seasonal transition and then you call it like a supernatural or uh, something where it's like just like a storm comes. Yeah, there's three types of transition as I see in our lives, right? There is seasonal transition. There is sanctifying transition. That's uh, the Lord working in us to, uh, to to bring us to the image of Christ, and then there is sudden transition, when 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 something just comes out of the blue that changes your life, the death sure. of a loved one, sudden tragedy, uh, losing a job, going through a divorce, sudden. Um, so there's different types of transition that we need to to negotiate in life, you know. So I think one of the things like being in this current, like almost like sailor moment, it's like a pause moment. I mean, people are going for it, trying to renegotiate business contracts and new ideas. And I think part of it has to happen. It's, it's real life. 
but there's this other part of it where it's almost a sense of could you take stock of your life could you just actually pull back and allow god to speak to you in a quiet place like i'm reminded of people like elijah or david in the cave you know the cave was often a place where we we think it was a cop-out but actually it was where god gave them creative courage for the next season wow and so there's almost this sense of us being in different caves if you like in our lives but wow. you know one of the things that i think people are having to face is when they slow down they realize their lives are in transition i'm not talking about COVID. i'm talking about god is trying to transition them either from teenage years to young adult years or from you know early early parenthood to teens or from later mm. 40s i mean you tell a funny story of when you go to the movies i'd love you to tell that but speak oh. to us about seasonal transition because i think one of the things that happens as we pull back and we look at our lives is we got to be honest and say we're not what we were 10 years ago and god is no. doing something different so let's you know be a, a, appreciative of it speak to us about transition um well the thing is, none of us like, when you get older, you don't, I mean, change is something that um, it gets harder as you get older. And uh, we fight it, you know. Um, and I remember when I turned 65, which was like 20 years ago, uh, I, uh, when, I, when I turned 65, uh, in the UK, you get lots of benefits. And one of the benefits is that you can get a senior ticket in the cinema. Now, I, I love the cinema. I love the cinema, right? And I, you know, I've got, a, I've got a, a procedure, right? I love going to the cinema. I get, I, I buy a, a large uh, bag of sweet popcorn and a latte. Love it. And I go in there, land, wonderful. So I turn 65 and says, there's no way that I'm going to ask for a senior ticket. No, you must be joking. I'm not going to, it's just confessing to old age. I'm not doing that. So I go to the cinema one night and I realized I hadn't bought enough money for a latte and a, and a popcorn if I had a normal ticket. But if I asked for a senior ticket, I could have, have the, so I'm thinking, oh, I've got a bit of a problem, you know. So I had to succumb to the transition to seniorhood because I wanted my latte and my popcorn. So I went up to the girl and I said, and I said this, I said, um, go see the ticket, please. She said, excuse me, sir, can't, go see the ticket. She said, please, can, you, can I have a senior ticket? I really <laughs> meant Come on. Then she gave me the ticket and I said, don't you want to see identification then? She said, she looked at me and went, no. <laughs> it was a blessing. So, but transition, transition in any form um, is, um, and I've just been, I, I did a, a live um, chat with a friend of mine. In fact, she's the, she edits my books and she calls it the space between. I love that phrase. Yeah. And I've been meditating on this, the space between. And I was thinking about the space between, for instance, a promise that God gives you and the fulfillment of that promise. Yeah. And, and, and the space between, you could call it transition, you could call it um, fermentation in an agricultural form, like a grape that's been crushed, right, is, is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a grape in waiting to become wine. So the, the fermentation uh, period, it's in the darkness after being crushed, so you can talk about fermentation, you can talk about, um, you know, um, uh, gestation. There's lots of ways you can, you can sort of, um, you can talk about transition. But for me, and I've written some stuff down here, um, when you go through, when you go through um, this space between a promise that God gives you and the fulfillment, like you mentioned David, 17 years. He waited. He was in transition. I mean, he was in that cave. He could still taste the anointing oil in his mouth, <clears throat> thinking to himself, "Was I imagining it?" Um, you have you have of twelve years from the, the dream to the the fulfillment. You've got Abraham, twenty five years from the promise to the birth of Isaac. What about this one, wow. right? Eve was given a promise in, in the Garden of Eden, and it took 3,000 years to get fulfilled. Yeah, so come on. 
But you know, but what I, you know, what I find during that space between Dylan, uh, in my experience, you'll experience uh, like self doubt. Um, you'll battle with discouragement, and also you will also have to deal with manipulation because we get impatient, so we try to manipulate the promise. That's so we good. Keep the doors open. We try to put ourselves in the right place, meet the right people, and we try to self prophesy. We try to try to self fulfill it. Um, Abraham tried that with you know God gave him a promise of a son. He ends up giving God a helping hand and produces Ishmael, and had all sorts of problems. And so lots of things happening in that space between. But I wrote, I wrote down even just just this last few days. During the process of the space between, you will experience, first of all, vows. I call those a uh, space between a broken dream and a hopeless future. I'm not going to go through all these because it will take too much time, right? Um, I'll come back to valleys, right? Then we will experience nights, the close of one day, the space uh, at the opening of another day. So the night is the space between. We all yeah. go through night seasons. I call that um, uh, the, uh, from PM to AM, from past mistakes to another mess. There's a space between. And some, many of us, we make bad decisions and, and in the past and bad mistakes. And so then we lose our confidence of making mistakes in the future because we yeah. think I'm in the middle here of past mistakes, all I can see is another mess. Uh, and so you go through that season. There's, <clears throat> there's Egypt. We would visit Egypt. I call that the reversal of a, uh, the reversal of a destiny to a resuming of a destiny, that's Joseph. But let me just mention the valleys. Can I just mention the valleys, man? Yeah, please go for it. Because <clears throat> uh, there's so much stuff, I'll, I'll be here all night. But the valleys, you, during a season of transition, and somebody may be there now. That's why I feel I need to major on this, okay? Um, the valleys is the space between a broken dream and a hopeless future. That is a horrible place to be. Sure. Picture Picture this. So Jesus is with the disciples in the upper room. They're all psyched up. Jesus is going to bring in the kingdom. Uh, the promise that he gave us will soon come to pass. So he gets involved in a conversation with these guys and starts to share about the upcoming betrayal, crucifixion, and death. And I can imagine their hearts sinking their dreams broken right there, like smashed in a moment, thinking, what? Yeah. And then without giving them time to recover, he says, let's go. And it says this, and they go out into the night. They're heading for Gethsemane, okay? But before, between the upper room and Gethsemane, there's the Kidron Valley. So they are now going from a broken dream right to a hopeless future because they're just about to experience the arrest and the death of jesus but jesus takes them down into the kidron valley and as they're going through the valley between a broken dream and a hopeless future that's when jesus stops and wow. he, takes, he takes a bunch of grapes and he starts teaching them in john 15 you read about it he starts teaching them the wonderful message about I'm the vine and you are the branches. Uh, without me, you're going to do nothing. And what I got out of that was sometimes it's not, Jesus is not only selective of what he teaches us, but he's selective where he teaches us. And imagine the mindset of the disciples, broken dream, hopeless future, but Jesus saw it the best time to teach them this. Wow, that is amazing. That's honestly so powerful. I think it if you're listening to this right now and that's speaking to you, I think we should all just shout amen in the comments tabs just to kind yeah. of agree with this moment and realize God is actually teaching us in the values. It's actually he chooses the times. I love that yes. he chooses 
Billy Graham said, wow. Billy Graham said, uh, Billy Graham said, fruit doesn't grow on mountains. It grows in the valleys. Sure. And, and watch this now. God is not, this is powerful, mate. I, you see, you know, it, it's when we think God is, uh, when we think the, in our worst, God is teaching us the best. And we need to thank God for the transition of valleys. There are people listening to me right now, right? And they, they are coming from a broken dream. Something has died. A dream they thought that would, would materialize. A relationship they thought that would work out. Yeah. Uh, a business a deal they thought would, uh, would, would come to fruition. Smashed in a moment. But they've got to keep moving. And they're down in this valley. And all they can see is like a hopeless future. No, listen. Wow. Listen. God is, listen to what he's saying to you. He's about to teach you one, some of the greatest lessons about fruitfulness that you will ever, ever learn. It's so powerful. Because you beautiful. know, yes, let me just say this one more thing, right? So, so, so because Jesus is not, it, it's not just fruit. It's, it's not just fruit that he's after. He's really after wine. Come on, I knew you were going to speak into this. This is so powerful. I hope you guys are hearing this. He's not after fruit. He's after He's wine. Not. Fruit is short-lived. It comes off the tree. It's time is done. But wine matures over time. Pastor Ray, you are preaching now. Woo, we're getting a little bit warm here. This is exciting. Fruit is for us. Wine is for others. So, so, and I, I, I just read a book by uh, T.D. Jakes called Crushing. And that's why I'm looking at some notes down here. And he says this, God is not necessarily after fruit, he's after wine, right? And, and throughout the book, he, des he describes the best wine, how the best wine is processed, okay? And he says, crushing and fermentation is essential for the wine to be at its best. And I believe I'm prophesying to Link Church now. I, I honestly believe. I, I remember telling you... Uh, um, uh, Dylan, not you know, you, you, when we were sitting down privately, and I think I mentioned it publicly as well. Um, I believe Link Church is an incubator. Remember me yeah, telling yeah. you that. And anybody who associates with Link Church, anybody who becomes a member or joins, I honestly believe the atmosphere in Link Church is like an incubator where dreams are incubated. Wow. And it's like this, and I and I think it's the same process. Like some people in the church now may be going through what they feel like a crushing. That's part of the plan. Because, because what's going to come out of you will be such a blessing for other people. He Amen. carries on and says this, right? If the crushing represents the pain in our lives, then fermentation represents the transition. When it comes to winemaking, the fermentation stage, I love this, is nothing more than a waiting area for the grapes. They've already been crushed. Now the grapes find themselves in the process of transition. And there are people listening, crushed with a broken dream, but don't despair because you're about to experience the greatest work of the Holy Ghost in your life because he's after wine. Watch this. The transitional uh, phase of destiny is very much like a seed planted in the ground. Watch this. Above ground, nothing seems to be happening. But below ground, in the darkness, in the isolation, in the silence, in the obscurity, the seed is transitioning. Amen. The only way that God can get the potential out of us is to put us in that place. To keep, oh, I love this. I need, I, I've got to get this out. Are you okay? Am I, am I doing all right here? This is right, so good. I think we're going to keep going. Yeah, for sure. Listen, to keep the seed from being buried in darkness and silence and obscurity is to condemn the seed to never realize its full potential. Wow. But to keep someone from being crushed by God, in, in when he does it, he does it on purpose, okay, with, for a reason, right? I'll say it again. To keep the seed from being buried in the darkness and silence and obscurity 
is to actually condemn that seed to never realize its potential. Watch this. The dirt that surrounds you right now, the darkness that envelops you right now, are not designed to destroy you. They're designed to develop you. You are not trashing, you are transitioning. And wow. Jesus chooses not only what to, like met very often he would say to the, to the disciples, there's some things I can't tell you right now. Why? Not because they were thick, but they, they weren't in a place to be teachable. And very often when we're in the valley, between a broken dream and a hopeless future, that's when we are the most teachable. This is awesome. This is good. And I know people are receiving it. I can see amens coming up along the list here. And uh, so if, you, if you're being blessed by this, I just want to say some people saying goosebumps, uh, which is to say God is working. So this is awesome. Yeah. And uh, I love it how you said uh, seasonal transition transitions or transitions uh, in the case of being seasonal are a process, not an event. I love to yeah. use these words. You said December doesn't ambush July. It follows it. So there's this sense that things take a process and we need to be patient in a process. And now, because so much has happened so quickly, there's been a sense of ambush. And we're going to talk about ambush just now because you said in one of your statements around calling that often God uses ambush to set you on a calling trajectory. And oh, yeah. I really love that. So, so I want to make a little bit of a turn towards calling because if I think about um, transition now, if I think about the dark space, the maturing space, I love what you're saying around uh, it's the, the pain is done and now it's a process of waiting for it to produce yes. the fruit and yes. the fruit to produce wine. Um, but one of the things I find to be so um, stabilizing in transitions or things that give us strength is to know our calling. And now that, that word is like a big word. It's thrown around a lot. Uh, you know, people would love to talk about calling and this and that. Yes. But you had a couple of points around calling recently in a live that you did, which I absolutely loved. And I, I thought we could spend a bit of time on that just as we kind of close this yeah, evening off, just to encourage people yeah. in their calling. I think that'll be powerful. Yeah. Uh, well, I think, first of all, there's a general call for all Christians. Uh, we are called um, just to just to allow Jesus to come out of our lives. Amen. Lord Jesus, see through my eyes, feel through my emotions, speak through my mouth. It's, it, that's the way we should live, where we work and live, we should be, not just do, okay? And that's a general calling, to be his witness. But then there are specific callings. And, and you know, I, I, you know, for me, it's um, when I, when I speak about calling, it's related to the ministry side of, of the Christian life. And I, 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 I was thinking about this the other day, and um, there's one scripture that I think really uh, helped me to help people, and it was, we, we know it well. It's, it's Proverbs 16, verse 9, and it says this, We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. And sometimes I've heard, you know, people receive it like, like God saying it like this. You can make your plans, but I'm going to order your steps. It's like, no, God says, make your plans. Do life. Yeah, come on. Make your decisions, you know, uh, do what you feel is the right. But he said, you can make your plans, but be prepared for me to ambush you. Be prepared for me to order your steps. And the call of God normally comes as an ambush. It normally comes to people who don't want it. It, it normally comes to people, you know, uh, there are some people who say, oh, I want God to use me. I want to show him that I'm available. So I'm going to give up my job and I'm going to fast and I'm going to pray. God, is, it doesn't work like that. I mean, I've written some stuff down here. Watch this. Moses was tending sheep in a desert, dealing with failure, when the call of God came. That's true. Uh, David uh, was taking sandwiches to his brothers when the call of God came. Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press, struggling with inferiority when the call of God came. Mary was probably doing her hair when the angel turns up. The disciples were fishing. What about this one then? Saul was on his way to murder people when the call of God came. So what I'm saying is they were making their plans, right? They all were just living life. They were making their plans, but, they, but God ambushed them. And I think 
that's an aspect. I mean, story of my life, Dylan. I mean, I was planning to emigrate to Canada. I had built up a business painting and decorating, and I was going to go there with my family. And and it like a, a couple of weeks before, they they I had a call from the local um, youth club in my village where I was born. Two thousand people. Uh, they had a youth club there, which I went to when I was a kid, and it was just about to close down. They had two members. And they said, we want four people who can work with young people to commit a year to build this up. And I said, I'm going to Canada. God says, no, you're not. He ambushed me. Wow. Come on. Yeah. Thank God for that moment. Because here we are, right? Sorry? I said, thank God for that moment. Because here we are, getting to do this because of it, right? You know what? I went to that. I spent a year there. Right? I cancelled all my plans. I knew it was God. See, he knows where you live. You know what I mean? <laughs> And he knows when he wants you. Mate, listen to this. I did a year. We built up that youth club to about 120 kids. Then I thought, well, God must want, want me to be a teacher in a school. So I made plans to be a teacher in a school. I spent nine months locked in my room studying to get the qualifications, right? To, to, to just go and enroll. Nine months. I was like, I had, I had information coming out of every crevice in my body, right? <clears throat> then on the, it's the Wednesday morning, I was due to go down to enroll in, in the teacher training. I, I had my next 10 years planned out. I go Wednesday, Tuesday night, prayer meeting in our church. I go to the prayer meeting. A group of young men were there sharing their vision they had a 3,000-seater circus tent, and they were traveling around the country using music and preaching to win people to Jesus. And two of the people are now working for Brian Houston. Um, Robert Ferguson and, 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 and uh, Steve Dixon are now working for oh, Brian in Australia. Come on. They were in the team, right? Watch this. I saw this. And over the tent, they had a big sign. People like you are coming to Jesus. I'm going to teach a training college. Wednesday morning, and the Holy Ghost said, no, you're not. You're going to join this team. I said, what about all the studying I've been doing? Well, he said, I had to get your brain in gear because you're going to be doing a lot of preaching. Wow, come on. Seriously, mate, I said nothing. On the way, the team left, and Robert Ferguson, who works with Brian, said to the team, there's a guy in that church who's going to join us and name me. And I, and I, and God has said, you're joining this team. Mate, he ambushed me. And that's how I started. So I you make that. your plans. Hey, do you know what? Make your plans. Go ahead. Have a ball. But if listen, as long as your heart is towards him, yeah. right? Yeah. You will know when he comes. I don't know if that answers the question. I think, that's, but. I think that's the big, no, no, this is beautiful. Honestly, I think God is speaking to people and ministering to hearts now because we actually need We need an encounter with God and his voice in this season. We don't need 10 steps. We don't need uh, foolproof no. ways of success. We actually need an encounter with heaven. And I love your story because you've spoken about how you had made your plans. I love it. Like one of the things you said in the, the call conversation that you had on, on Instagram was be your best self. Like in your case, that would have been like studying, become the teacher, like be your best self. Don't hold back waiting for God to do something. Give everything to the season you're in, you know? Yeah. Be yeah. the best you can be, whatever you're doing. But I love that you say, but the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the voice of God came. And there's this willing, there's this willingness in you. It's unique. Not everyone can tell the story. Most of us have this nudging to do things. And we just we're just putting it aside, putting it aside because our plans matter more. But I love how it says the little audio of steps. Let, let him actually direct the next step. Not just not just a voice in the distance, but let him actually shift your direction toward what he has by the Holy Spirit. This is powerful, Ray. I want you to talk about, a, um, you said, one thing, this is going to be liberating for people. We'll, we'll close on this thought, and I'm going to have to ask you to pray. Otherwise, we're going to be here all week. But um, oh, we speak about uh, stop, stop worrying about missing it. So when it comes to the call of God, when it comes to knowing you're in a transition or God's doing something new in your life and you're trying to understand this call or this, this shift in season, you said stop worrying about missing it. And this, this little thought right here 
liberating yes. me. As I heard it, you know, I've had this thought a few times. Speak to us about yeah. this. This is a big deal for people. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm freaking around with some notes here because I want to, because I'm very specific about writing down what God says to me. I just don't want to go on a, on a, you know, just on a thing. But I, uh, I um, look, uh, uh, yeah, don't worry about missing it. I wrote, I wrote this down. Don't worry about, okay, so as Christians, okay, none of us worry about uh, where we're going to spend eternity because our name is written in a book in heaven. So we don't worry about eternity. We know where we're going because our book, our name is written in a book when we die. What we've got to understand also is that according to Psalm 139, verse 16, our name is also written in a book before we were born. And I'm going to read it to you. Psalm 139, verse 16. Oh, man. Uh, David said, you saw me before I was born. What? So what are we worrying about to miss things? When you saw me before... Listen, man, I can imagine, sorry, my imagination goes, somebody, people watching, you know, well, I'm an accident. You're not the result of sex. You're the result of sovereignty. Amen. You're not the result of your parents. You're the result of predestination. It's like many people think, oh, I'm a failure. Really? Well, out of a hundred million little tadpoles f trying to get to one egg, there was only yeah. one little that got in that egg and that was you right so don't never say you're an accident or you're <clears throat> so so you saw me before i was born every day of my life was recorded in your book every moment was laid out before a single day that passed so if you are paranoid if people listening to me are paranoid about missing it right? And they give up their job, like I said, and try to put themselves in a place. The opposite is absolute, is true. I didn't choose what I do. Dylan, you didn't choose what you do. This is what Jesus said. You've not chosen me, but I've yeah. chosen you. Amen. Come on. It's not about, it's not about the onus of the call of God is not on you or me. The onus is on him. And when, so God, <clears throat> when God called me to plant a church in Newport, I, I think I was, uh, you know, I mean, the biggest mistake that he'd ever made. Because I, you know, and I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, but I, I've got no experience at this. I can sing and I can preach a bit, but building a church? Now watch this, man. He said, no, I've chosen you whether you like it or not. And you can argue with God like Moses did. I can't speak. Oh, yeah, 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 you finished. So, <clears throat> so I'm doing all this like Moses. And I said, and this is what he said to me. He said, he said, your lack of experience will actually be to your advantage. Watch this. He said, I asked Noah to build me something he'd never seen the shape of. Yeah. He said, I'm going to ask you to build something you've never seen the shape of. But wow, you will. That is so powerful for this time yeah. right now. He said, I know what I want. I know what I want. I, I, right? Noah had never even seen a boat. He didn't know what a boat looked like. I didn't know what the King's Church would look like. But he said, Ray, if you listen to me, if you give me your ear, I'll tell you how much pitch to put on the boat, where to put the nails. So I had to be, do you know what, Dylan? One of the greatest qualities a leader can have is insecurity. Sure. Not, not insecurity regarding your salvation, but insecurity that will cause you to trust him. I don't know how to do this. You better tell me. Paul put it like this. When I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. Your yeah, grace, he, he's, he said, he, had, he was a brilliant mind, brilliant thinker. But he says, I can't rely on that. So, so and, and that's what he did. That's what he did with me. So the call of God, the onus is on him, not you. 
Ray, I want to um, I want to ask you to pray for some people just as we close tonight. And um, I, I know uh, at the end of the service, by the way, if you guys are watching, if you're online, if you're visiting, wherever you're joining us from, we have a Zoom welcome lounge, which means that a link will come up. It'll come up now. It'll come up at the end again, and it's going to be an invitation for you to come and connect with some of our pastors. A chance to hang out, a chance to chat. If this message spoke to you, maybe we can even get into a personal prayer room with you. And just encourage you in prayer. But when you see the Zoom link come up, if you're new, if you want to check out, if you want to meet our pastors, please join in. It'll be awesome to have you there in a Zoom conversation. And also when we close the service, just after um, Pastor Ray to pray for us, we are going to go into a song that our worship team had pre-recorded for one of our Sunday services. And uh, it's a powerful song called Rattle. It's the new song by Elevation. And really is a song that speaks to dry bones coming to life. And as I've been in this conversation with uh, right now, I've even started to feel part of me starting to get really fired up to do what God's called me to do. Awesome. And, uh, and wherever you're joining us from, I just believe you got to hear this. you got to hear this. You're not a mistake. This is not by accident. No. This moment is a maturing moment. It's not a crush. The crushing has taken place. God is maturing us for the wine that he wants to bring. There you go. And so I just want to encourage you with that. And so Ray, maybe some final thoughts for the guys out there. And then if you could just, just lead us into a time of prayer and ministry, I feel like we could just actually engage this moment. Yeah, them. yeah, totally. There was something I, I wanted to... Uh, yes, you know, can I just say this, um, Dylan? Um, there, you know, there seems to... I read this stat, right, which really challenged me. Out of, um, out, of, out of every 10 people that start the ministry in their 20s, only one is there in their 60s. And I just felt there is an attack on longevity in the ministry. And, and the reason I say this is because it challenged me so much that in August, I'm, I'm starting a Zoom course on Zoom, on the Zoom platform. God spoke to me while I was here. I didn't know this. I'm starting a course uh, called Finishing Strong. It's an eight-week course, and, and I'm really going to get into some teaching. And if people have enjoyed the, the way that I teach and the stuff that I'm saying, uh, there's eight weeks of it, so just DM me on, um, on Instagram. Just follow me on Instagram, DM me with your email, and I'll send you the details. But there you know what? Great days ahead for you, my friend. I honestly believe, I honestly believe that Link Church, Link Church is going to incubate so many dreams. Amen. Uh, and even those that have been listening right now that are fe- that have that related to the crushing and, and the broken dream and the hopeless future, and now it makes sense. Yeah. Wow, so that's what's been happening. Um, there's going to be an absolute uh, explosion of, of dreams, you know. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for Dylan, his beautiful wife, and fantastic team, and this wonderful house. Thank you for uh, linking us up together relationally and umbilically. Just feel a real umbilical connection to this house. I thank you, Lord, that dreams are, that are in incubation, grapes that are in fermentation, um, um, the dreams that are gestating right now. Father, we thank you that we're in this stage. This lockdown has actually been a, a wonderful opportunity, a valley time for you to speak into our hearts and teach us the greatest lessons for our future destiny. Father, thank you that uh, you knew us before we were born. Every day of our lives were in a book before there was one of them. And I pray for anyone who's struggling with worry and fear and anxiety right now, may your peace that passes reason. They, Lord, let them get to a place where they say, I should be worrying, but why aren't I worrying? It's the peace of God that passes understanding. Bless them in Jesus' name. Amen.